if that's who it is that's number 46. But anyways, without much further ado, I'm not going to do the acknowledgement. We're very fortunate that this is a bonus um, evening for us. And uh, Robert has a couple of things to speak to us about. One is about loons and one is about his book. And from what I've read in the book, it's, it's an extremely good book. Um, I love that there's some comedic things in there too, and a little political, which is really quite nice also. So I think without further ado, we'll hand it over to Robert to discuss with us about Loons and his book. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Now I'm just going to, I'm just looking at the screen here. Get rid of that. Okay. Can um, hi you all. Sixty four people. I understand. Um, well, we're up to sixty nine. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah. So as Pam mentioned, I want to talk to you about two things tonight, and they're somewhat related. They're both uh, in the field of conservation biology. The first is my loon study which has been going on for about 40 years now. And the second is my book, uh, which Pam just showed you. So let's start with this loon study, which, which began, began as my master's thesis. I'm calling the, um, this talk Common Loon Breeding Success in Relation to Lake Acidity and Lake Size Over 38 Years. So I started this study as my master's thesis in 1982. And here we are in 2021, so it's about 40 years. And um, let me just... So here's a loon here. Now, I don't know if, if all of you know, but there are more than one species of loons. In fact, there are five species of loons. Um, and they all occur in, in both the old world and the new world. The new the uh, the common loon is characterized by the black and white mottling, which is fairly striking, which you can see, and the uh, and the bright red eye. The uh, other sorry, part, Robert, your your screen share didn't quite pop up for us. What the screen share did not? No, it did not. Oh, um, we still see you. Okay, uh, where should I find it, Brian? So uh, in the Zoom window, there's the green button that says share, the, the share button that should be near the bottom. Oh yeah, right. It's not there. Oh, in the, in the Zoom. And I, I re tastefully refrained from making a loon joke when you were talking about the loon oh. that we could see. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, you, you know what I think happened is I think I lost the uh, the Zoom screen. Um, I had it when we were practicing. Should I just go through and, and click the link again, Brian? Uh, you, well, you are still in you are still in the in the meeting, so it's probably a window. You may have uh, minimized it or shut it. Um, if you're on Windows, you might be able to Alt Tab and, and pull it up. Huh. I'm on a Mac. Oh, uh oh. But we had it a minute ago. Yeah. Uh... Huh. You, you could try following the link again. That might actually end up just uh, taking you back and telling you that the window is already open. Okay. Uh, open Zoom, are you enjoying? Share screen. Okay, this should do it. Oh, 
okay, we got a loon. Take it away. <laughs> got it. Okay. Phew. I killed about two minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, we've got five species of loons, and uh, the others you you may very well not be familiar with, or you, you may be with familiar with the red-throated loon, and maybe the the Pacific loon. The Arctic loon is mostly in the Old World, and the yellow-billed loon uh, is also is in um, the northwest of of, of North, North America. So loons are freshwater birds in the um, in the summer, but in the winter they become they become saltwater birds. And um, here here is a, a, a typical nesting island. They like using these islands because there aren't any or there there are fewer mammalian predators on these islands um, than than on the uh, than on the mainland. But if there are no islands or there's a lot of human activity, let's say boating, fishing. Uh, or even people camping or, or just spending some time on these islands, that'll kind of scare the loons away. And then what they'll do is they'll, they'll often go into a back marshy bay like this, and then, and then uh, build a platform here amongst the, sh the uh, shoreline vegetation. <clears throat> so, sorry to interrupt again, Robert, but if you wanna, you can maximize your, your slideshow like it, with the green button there and yeah. Perfect. I think Thanks. that's the one. What's that? Yeah, beauty. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, thanks, Brian. Beauty. <laughs> All right. All right. So here we have uh, loons, uh, because their legs are really far back on the body, they have a lot of trouble uh, moving around on land. Um, so what they do is they like to nest right next to the water's edge. So let's say this one, which we saw here, they can just go from the nest straight into the water. In this one, however, which had a lot of human activity on it, they decided to still use that island, but nest fairly high up. And this was very steep. So it was very difficult for, for them to get to the nest and back to the, um, and back to the water. Sometimes a totally different situation occurs and that's nesting way out in the open. This was in Killarney Provincial Park on Freeland Lake. And here, somewhere here in the middle is the nest. We, we can barely see it, or we, we can't even see it. Now we get a bit closer to it, sorry, we get a bit closer to it, and there it is in, in the middle. And you can see that there's some, uh, egg, some egg remains on this one. Can you imagine how easy it is for a bald eagle or, or a raven to, to spot a loon on a nest like this? Must be very easy, especially when you compare it to, to something like this or something like this. And then here we can see some of the egg remains. So when, when the eggs hatch or when the eggs are taken by a predator, um, what is left are eggshells and sometimes some egg membrane, which is the, the portion of the egg right underneath the eggshell. But back to the, the issue of, of how easy or how difficult the, the nests are to find. This would be the most difficult to find. You can't even see the nest in here. But fortunately, that doesn't happen too often. I did most of my um, surveying in September. So that way, I, I would only have to go and visit the lakes once to find out whether they produced any young, whether they, there was nesting on that lake. And I should say right, right from the start that I, I surveyed only one loon pair lakes. So lakes large enough for one loon pair. And that made it a lot easier to, uh, to find nests and to relate um, nests to loon chicks. And here I just wanted to mention that the males tend to be larger than the females, but it's not totally clear cut. If you see a pair and one is larger than the other, chances are it's the male, but not necessarily. There is some overlap. Um, sometimes you get to a nest and you find that there's a, a whole egg um, that hasn't hatched for whatever reason. And so in those cases, I would, I would break them up. There's nothing worse than the smell of a, of a, a rotten loon egg. And um, so here you can see the egg shell here, here, the outside of the shell and here as well. And then the inside 
of the, the so-called membrane, which will come up in the next slide. And then here you have the chick. So it wasn't an infertile egg, but it was fertile. It produced a chick, but for whatever reason, that chick uh, died. Now, these are what I call egg membrane sacs or intact egg membrane sacs. If you see these on the nest, you know for sure that the, um, that, that the uh, hatching has occurred. <clears throat> so basically the job of the parents is to uh, take care of the chicks, to feed them, and to, uh, to brood them as well, especially when they're very small like this. That chick that you can see in the nicely framed in, in between the two parents is probably just a day old or maybe two days old, something like that. And the parents have to, to care for them and, and feed and forage for them for about 11 to 13 weeks. And at that point, the, the young, if they're still alive, will be able to fly. This was on an acid lake, very small lake that itself was, was too small really to, to, uh, for, for loon chicks. Um, but it's, it was also a very acid lake. And we were pretty surprised to find these two loon chicks on this lake. And we felt pretty lucky that we found them there pretty much the day that, or the day before they had hatched. <clears throat> But we came back two or three weeks later and, and the chicks were gone. So probably what happened was that they starved. In terms of what the parents feed the young, um, there are quite a number of things. Mo most people think, oh, well, loons are, are fish eaters. They, they feed their young fish. But there are a whole bunch of other things that they feed them besides fish, uh, aquatic vegetation, newts, snails, clams, uh, dragonfly nymphs, which would be in, in the bottom muck in the loon shit, crayfish, whirligig, uh, gerinid whirligig beetles that spin around on the surface of, of the water, and then tadpoles and also leeches. Now, sometimes a parent will come up with, with a food item that's too, too big for the chick to handle and the chick will just reject it. In this case, the, um, the, the adult probably just ate the fish on its own after it was rejected by the chick. And this chick now is getting older, it's certainly a few weeks old, um, let's say maybe four to six weeks old, something like that. This is just a behavior that's called the, uh, the leg waggle. Don't know if there's any significance to that. This chick here looks like it was maybe even a little older than the one we saw in the, uh, in the last photo. And people talk about, about loon shit as if it's this dark stuff here um, on, the, on the bottom of the lake or right next to the, or right on the lake shore. But actually the loon shit is this white stuff here. And sometimes they go to, to an island climb up a little bit, turn around, face the water and, and do their thing and then go, go quickly back in the water. So if there's success, um, the, it, it takes 11 to 13 weeks for the, for the young to, um, uh, to fly. So acid rain, acid rain was a, a major environmental issue in Northeastern North America in the 70s and 80s. A lot of you will remember those days. Some of you won't. Uh, the problem was discovered in North America by Beamish and Harvey, who were two fish researchers from the University of Toronto, who went up to Killarney Provincial Park, which is just southwest of Sudbury, to do some kind of a, a fish study. And they quickly found out that a number of the lakes had absolutely no fish in them, no fish at all. So what happens, acid rain is created when sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides react with water in the atmosphere to produce sulfuric acid and nitric acid. These pollutants can be carried thousands of kilometers and fall as acid precipitation or acid rain. And uh, 
it's thought, well, now it's known that it affects all the different lake trophic levels. Limnological just means lake. Um, but the question then was, okay, but what about at the top of the food chain? So if acid rain affects uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton, uh, benthic invertebrates, uh, fish and larger fish, what about loons, which are at the top of the food chain? Nothing was known about that at the time. So here we have in the bottom, uh, bottom right here, we have a map of the Great Lakes and this area with the grid shows um, this whole area here, this whole map. So basically it's Georgian Bay or Lake Huron, Georgian Bay and Sudbury is just north of Georgian Bay. Here's Sudbury and North Bay is, is east about uh, one and a half hour drive. Um, here we have, so we divide, I divided the, um, the, the study area into three different areas to try and maximize the amount of, of, um, um, just a sec here, to try and maximize the, um, the acidity that, that the different lakes would, uh, would show. So, um, so area two here is Killarney Provincial Park, which I just mentioned earlier. Area one is just along this Highway 44. Area three here to the northeast of Lake Wanapate. And then area four here, which, which was to the north. Now there's an imaginary line that goes from southwest to northeast like this. Everything below that line tends to be acidic. It's bedrock. Whereas everything um, to the north of that line in area four and parts of area uh, one um, is, is, uh, is non-acidic. Those lakes tend, tend to be non-acidic. And so that way I had a nice uh, range of, of, um, of acidity, which went from 4.0 to 8.5. You'll remember from high school that uh, neutral is seven. So we're going from fairly acidic to, to fairly basic. This is a photo of, of the city of Sudbury back some years ago now. So the, the copper and nickel smelting that went on in Sudbury, that started in the 1880s. I'm just gonna grab a, a drink here for a sec. <clears throat> and then some, some decades after the 1880s, there was um, um, sorry, just, uh, just need a moment there. there. There were some stacks that were put up. Here you can see next to this huge stack, there was some, some stacks that, that were put up to send the smoke away from the city where people were having trouble um, having lawns and having cars without rust on them from this, from this uh, polluting uh, substance, this acid rain. But it's, it, keep in mind though, that it's more than acid rain around Sudbury, it's acid rain plus metals. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll mention that, I'll just go back here for a sec. Um, So one thing I wanted to mention about these acid lakes is that they're very, um, they can be extremely clear. Just to give you an example, the clearest lake that we had was um, about 20 meters. You could see 20 meters down, you would drop a black and white disc called a, called a Secchi disc, and you, you would drop it down until you could no longer see it. And then that would be the, uh, the visibility depth. So, and this plant here, I don't know, if you botanists are familiar with it, it's called Aerocolon septangulari, although the, the name, the specific epithet of that species name has changed. And I think it's vulgaris, I'm not sure, but in English it's just called pipewort. And it's pretty much the only, apart from filamentous algae on the bottom, it's pretty much the only um, P 
plant that grows in the very acidic lakes. And when I say very acidic, I'm talking about less than pH 4.5. So the work actually involved a lot of paddling and driving around, finding lakes, uh, paddling around the lakes to look for loons, chicks, and nests. And uh, nests were, you know, you had one nest essentially per lake, if, if any. Because as I was saying before, I only, I only did one loon pair lakes. And that was to facilitate uh, matching uh, nests to young. Then in the afternoon, later on in the afternoon, we do these alkalinity titrations. Alkalinity is a measure of the buffering capacity of water. pH is a, is a measure of the acidity of the water. But you could have two, two lakes with two different acidities uh, two different pHs or, or the same pH and they, they'll have different alkalinities. The work also involved doing a lot of observations because I mean my the theory I was testing really was that uh, are the are our parents having trouble raising uh, chicks because of a shortage of food. So basically I spent a lot of time just observing um, Observing, observing the, the loon families, and of course we did a lot of um, we did a lot of uh, uh, camping. This was the sort of uh, vehicle we should have had, but this was the vehicle that we actually did have. So we ran into some some problems up there with respect to the roads, and you know as as roads become disused because there's no more logging, for example, or people are no longer fishing in there then the vegetation starts growing in from the side. Other road problems could be extremely bumpy uphills and downhills. Even the, uh, the logging trucks sometimes had trouble. This one um, was probably going up this hill, a fairly steep hill, all loaded. And it, um, it snapped the, the drive shaft. It looks, looks to me like it snapped the drive shaft here. And then the uh, <clears throat> the truck started to roll backwards and then flipped flipped on its side. And then there are cases where you're even going through water. But fortunately, up in Sudbury, where it's bedrock, um, even even in the clay belt, it's uh, it's it's very rocky. You can actually drive through without getting stuck in the water. Always taking a chance, though. And then sometimes there would be, um, uh, in spring, there would be washouts where, where a road would just get completely washed out because the pipe, the culvert that they had put in wasn't wide enough, wasn't big enough in diameter. So the results back in 1988, so that was six years after he started the study, was that, that loons avoided small lakes and they avoided acidic lakes. They, um, the breeding success decreased with pH. So, so as, the, as the lakes became more acidic, the breeding success dropped. And there was higher breeding success on large and deep lakes. Um, the parents foraging success decreased with pH. So they would have to make more dives um, on acid lakes to catch a certain number of fish or food, food in general. As the chicks grew uh, to this 11 to 13 week age, age range, um, parent dive times increased, foraging success rates decreased, and the food changed from invertebrates, small fish and vegetation to, to larger fish. So all this to say that the food types that the parents were feeding the, the chicks changed as the chicks um, grew, grew older. And uh, here we have um, a pair of loons attempting to raise a small chick on a highly acidic fishless lake, which itself was a pretty rare phenomenon. Most of the acidic lakes were avoided by the loons, but there was one, Marjorie Lake, number 26, where um, they, they tried year after year to raise young and they were always unsuccessful. And probably because the chicks, the chicks uh, uh, starved. And anyway, so this pair of loons attempting to raise a small chick on a highly acidic fishless lake fed the chick 
benthic algae, that's, that's algae from the bottom, and possibly benthic invertebrates, but they flew to other lakes to feed themselves. So the adults could survive, but they couldn't, they could, they're they not programmed to bring food back from other lakes. Although there's one person who has seen that on three occasions and nobody else has ever seen that again. In other words, loons ferrying, ferrying food from one, lake, from one lake to another. And then the other thing that I noticed was that the family remained in one small bay rather than cover the entire shoreline of the lake. Normally in, in, in a normal lake, they, um, during the day, they, they, uh, they cover a lot of the shoreline because they're, ch they're chasing after fish. But in this case, they didn't cover a lot of, they, ju they just stayed in one small bay and um, because there were no fish to, to chase after. So the conclusion being that the high level of brood mortalities on, ac on acidic lakes probably resulted from a shortage of suitable food for chicks. So the chicks starved on the acid lakes. But I decided to make it a long-term study with several questions in mind. Was there a cr critical pH, for example, a pH below which breeding would be um, impossible? And there was, and it was basically pH 4.4. Breeding was impossible below that pH. Was there a suboptimal pH? Well, the pH of six turned out to be a suboptimal pH in that above, Above pH six, everything was fine, but below pH six, um, uh, <clears throat> below pH, okay, we'll just move on here. Um, another question was, did pH change over time? And the, the fact is that the pH did increase over time, but but for the loons, things have not gotten better. So the biological, um, the biological uh, recovery of the lake did not, has not been following the chemical recovery. And I think, yeah, so pH less than six is suboptimal for loons. That's what we found in this study and also aquatic life in general. So we would expect that to apply to loons as well. And EC stands for Environment Canada. Environment Canada was heavily involved in, in the acid rain um, research until, um, well, until I think it was the, the 90s that it, it finally got cut by the federal government, unfortunately. So maybe we can, this marks the end of our loon talk. Before we launch into the book, um, maybe we've got some, some questions, Brian? or I'm clicking on Q and A, right? Uh, that's correct. So far, I don't see any. Um, if anyone has questions, you're free to type them into the Q and A. Can you allow them to do it vocally? Uh, they can also raise their hands. Uh, that is an option under the chat, but there is a, a question that's come in. So I just click on Q and A, right? That's right. No. Yeah. So it's a question from David Morris. He asks, "Are there uh, lakes that are naturally acidic?" Um. Yes, there are lakes that are naturally acidic, but not in in our hemisphere. I th or, or not in. Um not where we live. I think that there are some acidic lakes up in the Yukon or the Northwest Territory some, someplace, and they're acidic for, for completely uh, geological reasons that, that I don't know very well. And uh, Robert, does your uh, webcam aim down a little bit? We're, we're sometimes seeing the, the top of your head, if, if that's possible. Um, okay. But uh, next question, uh, Jenna Van, or Gina Van Dorp, says, I saw no loons in Killarney in 1974, uh, 20 years later, they were numerous. Not, not surprising because um, uh, Killarney, was, Killarney was, had the most acidic of, of all the lakes in my study area, along with uh, area three. So um, yeah, not a big surprise. 
and, and good news, a good news story for an area that was really hard hit. Uh, David Morris uh, says again, uh, in the earliest days, the ore in, at Sudbury was smelted in open pits, which That's devastated right. the vegetation all around Sudbury. And, and so can you just read the, the last phrase about the vegetation? Oh, yeah. yeah, he says that it, it devastated the vegetation all around Sudbury. It I did. Think he not, said it actually turned it into a moonscape. In the it chat. did turn into a, a moonscape. It became kind of famous for that. And I talked to a fellow who grew up uh, very close to the, uh, to the stacks. And he, uh, as a kid, remembers that uh, a helicopter would fly over and drop these, these uh, uh, containers full of lime. And then people would bring out their rakes and they would just, they would just rake the lime and mixing with, with the rainwater would, would uh, bring up the pH quite a bit and, and allow uh, the original vegetation to come back. Uh, so David Morris also asks, has anyone tried seeding a formerly acidic lake with uh, live, I guess, live animals from other lakes or livestock? So they've, they've done that. Um, actually, actually, can you just read that one more, one more time, Brian? I just want to make sure about one word there. Yes, so he says, has anyone tried seeding a formerly acidic lake with live from other lakes? So that, I don't think that has been done in North America other than on some kind of experimental basis. So the people up in Sudbury might have done that, the Ministry of the Environment. There's some folks down in the States who, who did a lot of work on, uh, on acid rain. They might have uh, done that. But in Europe, in uh, Scandinavia, that's where it would have been done to actually, uh, to actually help the lakes because they figured that they could put a dent into the situation. And that's because um, people live so much further north there than, than here. Um, so uh, Philly Clark is actually suggesting that you put up your next slide showing your, your nice little loon picture. Sorry, and I'm... also asks, uh, how many chicks do they normally have? And have okay. you seen any deformed chicks? So I've never seen a, a I have seen a deformed chick. Normally they, they lay one or two eggs. So they have one or two chicks. Um, I did find, find a, a, a deformed chick. It was kind of deformed. What it had was a, a big bulge in its throat. And I was really curious to know what that bulge was because I knew that the lake was quite acidic. The pH was around 4.6, 4.7. Um, I was able to capture this. Uh, it, it was very weak and, and dying. So I was able to put it in my canoe and bring it back to Ottawa. And I had the people at the Canadian Wildlife Service look at it. And what they, um, what they found was this. So you can see that this, this here is a whole mass or bolus of food, including fish. You can see this perch right here. But there, there were other things in here as well, which once I teased everything out, I could see that there were a lot of crayfish. I could see that there were um, uh, dragonfly nymphs, this group here. Um, and this little group here was those those gerinid whirligig beetles. You could see the, the hard uh, their hard backs, their hard shells. Let's say they're actually wings, and then and then perch. All this was all packed together in in the uh, in the esophagus. And uh, I think what happened was that uh, a loon, this loon chick probably swallowed a fish that was too big for it, and 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 damaged the throat, damaged the esophagus, so that anything that, that came down the esophagus later got stuck there because th there was neurological damage. The, uh, the, uh, the swallowing was, 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 had ceased to be. And so, um, and I teamed up with, uh, with a R Rob Campbell from, um, from he's, a, he's a veterinarian at, um, at the, the University of Guelph. And he actually found in the esophagus that there was some damage as the food had gone down. 
course, we, we never found that big fish that it would have swallowed because it did make it all the way down eventually. And um, um, but, but it got digested in, in the digestive system sub -sub subsequent to that. But all of this stuff came in after the fact and uh, ended up in this big bolus. I think that covers the, the questions. Uh, yeah, that's so that that's horrifying. I'm glad that nobody is able to look back and, and lay out the last 20 meals that I ate. Um, it wouldn't be a pretty sight either. Uh, <laughs> Feli Clark, uh, I'll, so how many chicks do loons have? Two, typically? one or two. There, there have been cases of uh, three egg nests and there have been cases of, of three chick broods. Um, but that's pretty, very rare. I, I've never seen uh, a three egg nest or a, or a, or a three chick brood. Uh, so another uh, question, in you, any of your research, have you found there is an adaptive advantage of red eyes in loons or other birds? There might very well be, but I'm I'm not up on that. I I'm not uh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, Elizabeth McKinley asks: Is the loon population in this region remaining stable over the last fifty years? So I, we can talk about the last uh, forty years, and the loon population has been declining. Now, it turns out that the loon population has been declining uh, throughout Canada and the loon productivity has been declining. That was one paper that, that Doug Tozer did from Bird, Birds Canada. Um, we know from our work, we, we've recently published three papers. One of them showed that, um, that in Ontario, the, um, uh, the, the loon population has declined and, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the loon productivity has de declined as well. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's, oh, another question just came in. Uh, David Morris asked, how much of the decline in population is related to power boats? A lot of it. I think that the, the fact that the, um, the southern part of the breeding range of the common loon is in the U.S. It goes across the U.S. somewhere. It used to be much further south. So the, so the southern portion of the range is moving north. And that's, I think it, it must be because of human activity. So that would include boats and cottages or other, other human developments. Uh, Lucy and Kirby ask, how are we in 2021 compared to the 1980s in terms of acid rain? And what is being done or what has, been, what has to be done about it? Well, when we talk about acid rain to the, the federal government, they, they feel that they made a lot of progress in coming up with this transboundary tr treaty with the United States that, that decreased the acid rain quite a bit. But when it, um, but acid rain is, is still a problem as, as we see in Sudbury, even though the lakes are, are coming back there, there are still a lot of lakes that are affected. And outside of, of Sudbury, we're, we're pretty sure that, that, um, um, that it's, it's still quite a problem. The, the problem is that nobody's really, nobody's really looking at acid rain anymore. And the other thing about it is that it has become, it has become a, um, a more complex issue than it used to be. So uh, Schindler, David Schindler, um, one of, one of our foremost limnologists, lake scientists, back in the 90s was talking about the so-called triple whammy affecting boreal lakes. And the triple whammy was acidification, the decrease in UV in the UV layer, and uh, sorry, in the, uh, in the ozone layer and climate warming. Those things conspired together using biological, chemical, and physical means to make lakes warm more quickly than they would if it was just under climate warming. Any more questions on, on loons? There's, I think we'll just take one more question uh, from Peter Middleton. 
how long do loons live and does this mask declines? So loons can live for upwards of 30 years. And uh, does it mask the decline? Um, that's an interesting question. Well, I guess it, it would to some degree, but I mean, eventually the, the loons are gonna die and then they're gonna be, you know, an individual and a pair will, will be replaced by another individual. Um, that's a tough question to answer. I think that means it was a very thoughtful one then. Um, that's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's, that's, it. that's it for the questions. I think you, you mentioned you wanted to take a little, a little uh, couple minute break. Yeah. To stand up before the second part begins. I'll be um, right yeah, back. so, yep. So we'll just, we'll just pause for a minute and Robert will be uh, uh, commencing the second part of his talk momentarily. Okay, so rather than, than being a, a talk on a study, this is a talk on a book as you well know by now. And um, yeah, before I forget, I should, I should give out my, um, my email. If you're interested in purchasing one of the books, the email is robalvo1 at gmail.com. And um, the, the book is, it costs 44.95 with tax uh, 47.20. Now, so the title of this talk is the title of the book, Being a Bird in North America, North of Mexico. So think of North Sorry, America. Rob, could, could you uh, expand that to fill up your whole desktop? Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Yeah. And I'll put a link to you. You have a website, do you not? Yes, I do. Right here. Okay, I'll put it. I can put it. Oh, there it is. Excellent. Okay. So I, I wanted to cover the birds that were in North America means different things to different people, but uh, I wanted, wanted it to mean Canada and the US, including Alaska, but not inclu including Hawaii. Oops. So this book represents for me my the, the fifth phase in my evolution of capturing species. And what I mean there is we'll go through them. I grew up in Greece uh, from the ages of 10 to 17. And uh, I had a, a pellet rifle. And I used that to, uh, to shoot live things and dead things for about a year or two until, I, was, I think I was 12 at the time, until I outgrew that. I guess I outgrew it. I just sort of lost the, the interest in killing things. And that was totally on my own. I, I didn't get any lecture from any, anybody. So I'm kind of proud of that. What I did was uh, I took the pellet gun back to the, um, to the store where I bought it and uh, asked them if they would give me some money for it. And they did. And what I did was I bought a field guide to the birds of, to the birds of Europe with the money and with a bit of extra money that I had and, and was able to get later on. I got myself a camera so that I could actually uh, photograph. This was way back in the film days, of course. Things have changed quite a bit. Then when I came back to Canada as a, uh, as a biology student, I became a loon researcher. So my bachelor's thesis was looking at the effects of, of uh, human activity on loon breeding success. So actually trying to quantify and compare how loons were doing on, on uh, very busy, busy lakes versus very not busy lakes. <clears throat> busy in terms of people I'm talking about. Then when I went to Quebec City to set up the first conservation data center in Canada for the province of Quebec, I became, I was the zoologist and the data manager. As zoologist, I had to put together a list of all the vertebrate species in Quebec, but then uh, determine their conservation status rank. So um, is it a species at risk? Is it a rare species? Or is it a species that uh, is in fine shape? Or is it a species that is an invasive? So these, these were one after the other, they became sort of more um, 
more pointed sort of ways of capturing species. And the last one became this book, the Babina approach. So Babina stands for being a bird in North America. Um, yeah. Okay, this is a little finicky. So the goals, the goals of the book were one, to reach a broad audience. That included bir birders, naturalists, biologists, people with bird feeders, students. Um, give the reader an interesting and fun way to remember each species and each issue. And we'll look at some of the uh, cartoons at the end and try and make sense of them. And thirdly, to use birds as a test case for other for other groups, for example, other groups of vertebrates or insects, or even potentially all life forms with, with the same idea, the idea of trying to capture what's special about that species or what's special about that family. So the main features of the book were uh, the most interesting ask to, to, to figure out what's the most interesting, what are the most interesting aspects aspects of each species, tricks for survival, problems they face, ecology, birding considerations, unanswered questions, whatever it is about that species that I didn't already talk about for some other species and for which that, that species was a good example. Um, the cartoons I think were probably the most important part of the book uh, in, in terms of getting, getting people's attention. Um, there were global, there are global distrib distribution maps. So these are maps of the world showing the, uh, the global distribution. Nature serve conservation status ranks. So nature serve does a lot of work on species at risk. And uh, it's, it's by doing these, these uh, establishing these conservation status ranks that you, you can prioritize species for species at risk. Uh, I, I use the AOU, the American Ornithologist Un Union uh, Taxonomy, Nomenclature, and Species Ordering. There are some very nice, and we'll, we'll read some of them together, some very nice quotations from Arthur Cleveland Bent's Life Histories of North American Birds. Uh, here we talked about North America and what, what it stands for. Spanish names for each species for use in Mexico. I did that with. Um, with a, with a Mexican ornithologist. So we, were, we actually had Spanish names for all the species in the book, regardless of whether they occurred in Mexico. And, um, and then an appendix at the end that completes the list and status of North American birds. So here is a typical page. They're all set up with, with the same layout, four corners and the center. So the four corners are the names box, the cartoon, down here the map, and the nature serve conservation status rank. Um, so here you can see that the names in, in different languages, scientific name, French name, the English name at the top, uh, the Spanish name for Mexico, and then what order and family are they in? How are the different species related? The cartoon, whatever the aspects, were that, that I was able to come up with, they would, they would appear in the cartoons. Uh, a map of the world showing the breeding range in red and the, and the wintering range in blue. And uh, for species that, that occurred in the same place all year round, they would be, uh, there would be uh, violet or purple. So you can see that this species, for example, occurs in the, in the new world, but doesn't even occur in the old world. And then here we have the, uh, the conservation status ranks, which we don't need to go into detail in there. So this, um, this is a species that a number of you are probably aware, uh, familiar with. And I'm gonna read from, uh, from the book, the, uh, the first paragraph or so, the spruce grouse remains so woefully ignorant of the destructive nature of the human animal that unlike its cousin, the rough grouse, it rarely learns to run or fly away, but allows itself to be shot, clubbed or noosed. And in consequence has earned for itself the proud title
title of fool hen. So that's, um, and those of you have, who have seen it have probably seen it just standing there and allowing you pretty much to, to walk right up to it. This one here is a, is a, um, a shorebird. And it's one that I think we all probably know quite well. All plovers, and most of these quotes are from Arthur Cleveland Bent, that, that uh, those 20 volumes of books that I was talking about, they were actually written between 1919 and 1968. And the last, the last three volumes were done by, by somebody else because Arthur Cleveland Bent had died in the meantime. The killdeer, all plovers use distraction displays to lure intruders away from the nest or chicks. But the species that most often fools humans with this age old trick, also known as the broken wing act, is the killdeer. One wing was held extended over the back, the other beat wildly in the dust. The tail feathers were spread and the bird lay flat on the ground, constantly giving a wild alarm note. This performance continued until the observer came very near when the bird would rise and run along the ground in a normal manner, or at most with one wing dragging slightly as long as pursuit was continued. If the observer turned back toward the nest, however, these actions were immediately repeated. When the parents had succeeded in luring the intruder about 100 yards or 90 meters, they seemed satisfied as they then flew away. A killdeer may also pretend to incubate eggs or brood chicks on the ground away from the nest, leading predators to believe that the nest lies under it rather than yonder. And um, we have a few more of these to go through, but I, uh, I'm just wondering whether with these first two, there are any questions yet, the spruce grouse and the, uh, the killdeer. Just give people a minute or two to collect their thoughts. Any questions, Brian? Uh, no questions about these two. There is a, a, a loon question, but we can get to that at the end. Okay. Um, all right. So if you spent all your time in a marsh and wanted to communicate over a long distance with someone whom you couldn't see through the dense vegetation, you would likely find it easier to do so by using low frequency sounds rather than high frequency ones. Indeed, the American bittern is a large marsh dweller that vocalizes to mates and other individuals during the, the breeding season using low resonant notes described as Pumper, pumper lunk or pumper dink. These notes have been likened to the sound made by an old wooden pump in action. So there you have the um, the American bittern, which is much easier to see than the uh, than the least bittern. If there are any questions uh, there, you let me know, Brian. So this, this bird, which you may be guessing, but there are a few birds that look pretty similar to this with that white plumage. This is the only bird that has crossed, both crossed to the new world from the old world without direct help from humans and, and, and phenomenally expanded its numbers and breeding range. Cattle egrets probably crossed the Atlantic Ocean from Africa to South America in the late 1800s likely using the shortest route, and arrived in North America in the early 1940s. They continue to move northward. Renowned wanderers, they couldn't colonize the New World until cattle ranching became widespread. And their ability to forage along marine shorelines, for example, on exhausted small migrant birds, 
also helped them to disperse. In its original African foraging habitat of short grass meadow, it followed moving African buffaloes which stir up insects. The cattle egret now uses many hosts, even ostriches and, and tortoises. It often perches on the host's back or whips sedentary ones into action by making restless flights nearby. So that's our cattle egret. This is a very interesting story that is not really well known out here in, in Eastern North America, but is a very well known story in, in Western North America, in the prairies. All of the slough nesting ducks seem to be very careless about laying their eggs in the nests of other species. And that was from Bent 1923. Poor Bent would be kicking himself now for we know he was at the cusp of understanding a sneaky game that has been going on every spring in perhaps the least appreciated yet very rich North American habitat. Redhead females are actually very careful to lay their eggs in nests of other ducks, especially canvasbacks, to allow the, the latter to raise the yellow, the yellow redhead ducklings along with their own brown ones. The trick is called non-obligate brood parasitism. Unlike brown-headed cowbirds, which lay their eggs only in the nests of other species, redheads aren't obliged to. They lay eggs in their own nests as well. Other aquatic bird species are also involved in this battle in North America's so-called duck factory, as parasites, as hosts, or both. So that would be a really good example of when, when I'm talking about the um, uh, the various at, trying to come up with the most interesting aspects. This would be a really good example of one that has nothing to do with humans, whereas the effects of acid rain on loons is a story or aspect that um, that is the opposite. Um, so Robert, uh, Elaine has asked what the cattle egret was eating. What it was eating. Um, mo I, I'm guessing mostly insects because it, it hangs around cattle quite a bit. And I think what it's doing um, and by whipping the, the cattle into moving, it, the, the cattle moves a little bit and then the insects might fly off and that's what the uh, that's what it's that's what it's feeding on. Good question. So this is the, um, the lesser scop, and this is a very simple one. It's an identi identification issue or aspect. I asked Quebec biologist Michel Robert how to distinguish between the lesser and greater scops. Head shape, he said in French. The greater's head looks round, whereas the lesser looks like it's been whacked from behind. Kevin Wallace nicely portrays this image that has remained fixed in my memory for more than 20 years. That's one of my favorite ones. Right, so this one here is uh, the leeches storm petrol. Imagine camping in the middle of a petrol colony without knowing it. The ground below you would be riddled with burrows containing nests with incubating birds or lone young. And you could easily overlook the entrances which are usually surrounded by vegetation. And quoting from Bent, it is a weird experience to spend a night in a petrol colony during the breeding season. Night is their season of activity birds coming and going all the time, hardly discernible in the darkness, uttering their loud and peculiar cries as they call to or, or greet their mates. 
It is a wonder that the incoming birds can find their mates on the, or their burrows in the darkness and the confusion of thousands of fluttering birds. Experiments show that they use their sense of smell. There was nothing to indicate that beneath our feet lay a buried city teeming with life, a city of storm waifs gathered from an expanse of 1,000 watery leagues. Most people have never seen, uh, never see petrels, but birders do on specially organized pelagic bird, bird trips. Any questions there, Brian? Uh, David has asked how many species are in your book? 206 in the main part. And then, um, but in terms of how many species there are in North America that breed with any regularity, it's uh, about, when I did the book, it was about 670 species. So this book treats only the first, uh, not even third, 206 out of 680. And the, the criterion so that I- So two more volumes in the works? No, it took way too long. It took me 12 years to do just volume one. And um, so no, I'm not looking at doing any more volumes. It, it was uh, just about killed me. But we can still enjoy what we have here. So with the mallard, males with their unique upward curving black central tail feathers abandon their incubating mates and gather in small flocks to, to molt into eclipse or, co or concealing plumage. Unlike many other birds which wear a breeding plumage in summer and winter and a non-breeding plumage in, sorry, in summer and in spring and summer and a non-breeding plumage in fall and winter, duck, ducks wear a breeding plumage in winter and spring and an eclipse plumage for a short time in the summer. <clears throat> Given their high weight to, to wing surface area ratio, the loss of only a few feathers would make them flightless. So it, it makes sense to shed them all at once to reduce the flightless period during which they hide from predators in emergent vegetation. Aquatic birds such as waterfowl, loons, grebes, aningas, and even dippers can tolerate being flightless during molt because they can flee from predators by diving. Many terrestrial birds would be in big trouble if rendered flightless. And we've got, so the, the um, yeah. Anybody have a guess as to what this bird is? Think of the habitat, think of the typewriter. So it's the yellow rail, a bird that many birders have, have never seen. The rare yellow rail has provided some of my favorite ornithological experiences. In the 1990s, Canadian Wildlife Service biologist Michel Robert hired me to co-write a national status report with him. It was a perfect occasion for learning about the species. Later, a calling male was heard near Quebec City and Michel needed gut samples for a diet study. Armed with a bright lamp, a net, and two stones for imitating its typewriter-like tick, 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 tick call, we caught the bird. By injecting the harmless fluid tartar emetic down its throat, we obtained a gut sample for food analysis. I couldn't believe the bird's tiny size. On another occasion, we used a hunting dog to train, sorry, trained with yellow rail scent to look for nests. Doing this during the day, I appreciated the very shallow nature of the water in the rail habitat and its susceptibility to being drained by humans. Years later, I visited Manitoba's Douglas Marsh, a well-known breeding site. After five weeks of birding alone, I was curious to see another person. He looked preoccupied. What a coincidence. It was Bruce DeLabio, a birding guide from my hometown of Ottawa, playback machine in hand, trying to coax out a yellow rail after having had success with the Nelson Sparrow. 
he was scouting good birds through southern Manitoba, prairie potholes, etc., for his tour the next day. He told me the fascinating story of yellow rails calling along with the tick, 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 tick of the night train traveling through Richmond Fen, south of, south of Ottawa. And recently, Fred Heliner, 2013, wrote of an incident from some decades ago when one bird created a stir when, when its repetitive ticking noises behind a gas station in Northern Ontario became the subject of a police investigation. Perhaps a time bomb? So I, that should give you a pretty good idea, I think, of what the, what the book is about and um, uh, how I approached it and why I did things the way I did. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to try and give them a go. Yeah, so there are there are a few questions in. Uh, Philly Clark asks about the spruce grouse population wise. How is that going? The spruce grouse is probably doing well. Um, I haven't heard anything other than that. It's a resident bird. My guess is it's probably ju doing just fine. Ex well, once once you get above human habitation, but close to human habitation, it it probably just uh, doesn't occur anymore. So, like a lot of our species, it's declined, it's declined quite a bit. Uh, David Morris suggests that cattle on the move might also stir up insects that live in the grass, such as grasshoppers. I think referring back to the cattle egret. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> insects on the cow or on the uh, or on the uh, or on the ground and whenever whenever the the cow moves yeah. it's going to stir up some insects uh philly clark asks uh, do any ducks crossbreed with any other ducks mallards or red-headed ducks yeah the um i didn't read you the portion of the mallard um uh the mallard account that talks about hybridization. The, the mallard is a very aggressive hybridizer. It um, goes after uh, black ducks, for example, in North America. And so the black duck numbers are, are going down and their DNA is, be, is being um, watered down because of the mallard. And there are five other species the world, the world round that have been affected to, to quite a degree. And there's one that in Australia, I believe that has actually gone extinct or is almost extinct because of these aggressive um, mallards that uh, that that want to breed. Uh, an anonymous attendee uh, states there has been a long-term study of acid rain conducted on 58 Canadian Shield Lakes in the Kenora District including uh, seeding lakes with dola stone. Um, I guess the, the also says the Harper government tried to kill the study, but it has been saved. I don't know if you have any comments on that? Well, what I am familiar with is not so much one particular study, but, but a study area, which is called ex the Experimental Lakes Area, ELA. And the Harper government did try to kill, it actually closed the experimental lakes area, which was a, a huge area with a number of lakes in it, they were able to do um, whole lake experiments. And um, there was some, some excellent work that came out of there. For example, back in the days of phosphate, uh, they, what they did was they uh, took one lake shaped like an hourglass and put a barrier between the two, between the two sides of the lake and added a lot of phosphorus to one side and you could see very, very quickly that the, uh, the color turned green, greenish blue. And so there was a similar study, uh, a similar acidic, uh, acidic lakes study that was done in the experimental lakes area, but they had all sorts of work going on. So I'm guessing that the questioner is referring to the experimental lakes area. And a whole, there were of course a whole, a whole bunch of other, uh, uh, studies that would have been done there, besides just the acid rain and the and the and the soap, the phosphates. 
Uh, we have one, one more question in the queue here. Uh, Leslie Wood asks, why did you choose the loon for your studies? It wasn't my choice actually, it was, and I should have mentioned this earlier, I meant to, to mention David Hussle, the late uh, David Hussle, who at the time, 1982, was the executive director of uh, Long Point Bird Observatory. It was his idea. Uh, he knew that acid rain was a big problem and it just occurred to him that, well, is, is it potentially affecting any birds? And if so, which bird might it affect the most obviously? And uh, so that, that's how they, the other, the other thing, the other reason for using the loon was that loons are very popular and people really care about them. So in terms of fundraising further down the line, it would be a lot easier, probably be a lot easier to fundraise for loons than for, uh, uh, than for from spruce grouse, for example. So the, the cute animals get the funding bucks, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, that's all that I see for questions. Uh, I think, Pam, if you're going to come back on. OK. Well, I hope everyone has enjoyed this. Uh, Robert, um, I'm, I haven't completely read the book yet, but uh, it's quite entertaining. It's quite informative. And your talk on the loons, your work on them was quite uh, evolved and um, certainly has, I'm sure, put up a lot of good scientific um, knowledge out in your field. Um, I'd love to thank you very much for being with us tonight. It's been uh, quite entertaining. And um, I hope um, Marilyn Shriver will enjoy your book and to stay tuned to some of our other um, to all our members to stay tuned to some of our other uh, presentations because we'll continue to give the book as a um, door prize. And Robert, thank you so much for um, coming and doing this presentation for us tonight. Well, th thank you, Pam and John and Brian for bringing this whole thing together and for in inviting me. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was a bit, it was a bit tough doing two, two presentations in one. I usually just do the one. So I had to cut out a few things here and there, but I, but I, think, I, I think people got the general gist of it, or I hope so. Yes, I'm sure we did. It was, it was very well done. Thank you so much. And to everyone, um, our next uh, presentation is me. So I hope you can stay tuned with that, which should be quite interesting for me doing my first one on Zoom. Uh, and that's February the 11th. So on that note, I think all our questions have been answered and please stay safe and careful and wear your masks. And thank you so much again, Robert. Thank you, Pam. Okay, good night. Good night. Thanks, Robert, have a good night. Thanks a lot, Brian, good work there. <laughs> Happy to help. <laughs> Take care. You too.